So I'd like to thank the organizers, but I have to say it's very intimidating to follow Rick and Nancy. Nancy's had such an amazing career, and she's leading a company that I consider to be one of the most innovator, in, innovative kids on the block. And um, you know, Rick is the best pilot I know. <laughs> but um, I think it's fair to say that for, for the, the, the lab members, uh, my group members who are here today, you, part of the reason why we wake up in the morning, it's, it's inspired by the research that comes from, from Rick's group. And um, today, I'll tell you a little bit, sort of with the theme of being a, a new person, I'll tell you a little bit about um, our lab's approach to trying to tame a master regulator with emphasis on the prolific oncoprotein CMEC. Um, and uh, much of what we'll talk about today is actually unpublished work. So that's how early we are. Okay. So first to start out to tell you a little bit about my lab, um, uh, what, thinking about convergence, it was actually very difficult when I was considering different faculty positions to leave the Kendall Square area. Um, in part because of what Phil said, we're right across the street from the Broad Institute, across the river from all these other amazing medical institutions with researchers who are spending a lot of their time building lists of different diseases that are associated, uh, different genes are associated with different diseases. And in our lab, we want to innovate in the earliest stages of drug discovery in two ways. First, we want to develop tools and technologies that will enable us to credential these different types of targets emerging from genomics. Um, and secondly, we'd like to expand the repertoire of targets that uh, the pharmaceutical industry would actually consider to be druggable. Um, and our goal is to actually build uh, chemical probes that will physically associate with the proteins encoded by these genes and to evaluate the consequences of modulating those proteins in a system setting. So if you're a pharmaceutical company and you want to invest a lot of money into developing a therapeutic, um, the, the genomic association is quite frankly not enough. You need to know more about the consequences of modulating that, that protein in an appropriate setting. So this is essentially target validation. Um, unfortunately, many of these, these genes coming from, emerging from genomic studies are not what we call the usual suspects from a therapeutic standpoint. What that means is we don't necessarily have the rules to design drugs for them. And transcription factors, I think, are the prototype of, of that kind of gene. So transcription factors, as Rick had mentioned, have been implicated in a broad spectrum of diseases. And here you're seeing just different, different uh, transcription factors that have been implicated through specific lesions in autoimmunity, fertility, um, different blood disorders, uh, neurological disorders. And this is just a, a small snapshot of a growing list of transcription factors that have been implicated directly in disease. It's more obvious when you move on to cancer and you look at different types of amplified cancer genes, some of which we've known about for quite some time, different uh, transcription factors that are germ germline mutated or have frame shift mutations. This is actually a pretty broad spectrum of both liquid and solid tumors. And it, the list gets even longer when you start to look at specific somatic mutations associated with different transcription factors. I, Unfortunately, as Rick mentioned, transcription factors are sort of the prototype of an undruggable target for several reasons. Uh, the first being that when we purify these proteins away from their, their partners within a cellular setting and try to run traditional in vitro assays that we're familiar with in the lab, uh, many of these proteins become fairly disordered. Uh, they're fairly floppy. They're essentially a piece of spaghetti, and when they bind to their, their important partners in the cellular setting, they roll up into a piece of rotini. As a chemist, it's, it's almost impossible for me to think about how would I design small molecules that bind to those disordered regions. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that many of these proteins, uh, when they have ordered domains, particularly the domains that recognize DNA, these domains lack what we call traditional pockets for binding to small molecules. And so, again, how do you design small molecules that will, will, will bind to these targets if we don't have those kind of pockets? And then a third challenge is that for most uh, compounds that will need to target a resident nuclear factor, um, that compound's going to have to actually make its way into the nucleus, and that's also somewhat challenging. 
for latent cytoplasmic transcription factors, we may have the opportunity to modulate that transcription factor in the cytoplasm. But the majority of transcription factors are resonant nuclear factors, and so they have, these compounds will have to get into the nucleus. And so this, as someone who wanted to spend my career thinking about how do we design things, um, started to take a step back and think, think about, can we develop tools and technologies that would get around some of these issues? and started to think about small molecule screening. So in, in our lab, our strategy is to try and find small molecules that will directly bind to full length, intrinsically disordered proteins. We're playing dumb. We're looking for compounds that may physically associate. And then we take these compounds and we evaluate them downstream in functional assays. We like direct binding assays for a couple of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is that um, again, it enables us to play dumb with, re with regard to mechanism. And in a primary assay, you can uncover different compounds that bind that may act through different, uh, different mechanisms of action. Okay, so in our lab, the, the key questions that we have, can we build a general and systematic platform for developing or uh, finding these pinches of magic dust for transcription factors? And if we can, we want to ask, can these small molecules be used to dial back or tune aberrantly overactive transcription, particularly in cancer? We want to use these probes to ask specific questions. Um, is, is targeting a master regulator directly too toxic? Because these master regulators have so many functions. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Um, if you can directly target something like Mick, coming back to your question, um, do you have the opportunity to build a small molecule therapeutic that would enable you to target a broad spectrum of tumor types for which that, that master regulator is a driver of the malignant phenotype? Um, there are a number of questions here. We just, we're chemists, we just want to take a step back, find small molecule probes, and use these probes to weigh in on some of these questions. We're not necessarily in this to build drugs specifically. Okay, so in our lab, the technology that we use is actually called uh, small molecule microarrays. It's kind of an old technology. Um, let's see. And, oops. Uh, basically, what we do is we robotically array uh, stock solutions corresponding to different drug-like compounds onto a series of chemically derivatized glass microscope slides. We deposit picoliter volumes of these compound stock solutions. That leads to features that are roughly 100 micron in diameter. Um, we can print 10 to 20,000 different compounds onto a single glass slide. And then what we do is we come in with a solution of our favorite protein and uh, look for potential binders using some sort of fluorescence-based readout. Then we evaluate these putative binders downstream for transcription factors. We think that this technology is enabling for a variety of reasons. One, we can actually screen pure protein and look for compounds that may directly bind to that target. But in partnership with Jay Bradner, who was mentioned earlier, when we were developing this technology, we, we came up with a screening modality involving cell lysates. So we asked if we could apply cell lysates with target either overexpressed or endogenous target, and using antibodies or some sort of fluorescent reporter, look for compounds that may bind to complexes. So um, you know, we do this by fractionating different cells. Sometimes we'll look at nuclear fractions. Sometimes we'll look at whole cell lysates. But the idea behind this type of screen is that you can fi potentially find compounds that will bind to that target in a more relevant conformation or shape within a cell, ideally in partnership with other, um, say, uh, key transcriptional uh, cofactors. The other reason why we like this assay is it enables you to take multiple shots on goal. You don't necessarily have to find a compound that binds directly to, say, MYC, but you could also find compounds that bind to nearest neighbor proteins as well. And while I care about trying to come up with ways to target undruggable targets, a patient really doesn't care about mechanism of action. So uh, when you develop a new technology, you want to de demonstrate that it's general. We've used this technology to sort of plow through about 100 different human transcription factors. Uh, another thing that you want to do is go after a, a problem that has sort of plagued the field. And um, many years back, I, I had an opportunity to spend some time in Bob Tejan's lab, and he said, you've got to go after Mick if you want to show that this works. So, um, so the rest of what I'll tell you involves our sort of early approaches to try and modulate, build chemical probes for MEC. 
Um, MYC is one of the most prolific oncoproteins that's thought to be deregulated in about 70% of human tumors. And here I'm just showing you a list of different types of aberrations corresponding to both uh, solid tumors and uh, liquid tumors. And de depending upon who you talk to, the estimates for deaths in the United States exceed 100,000 uh, patients per year. But MYC is the classic undruggable target, in part because it engages a number of different proteins to exert either its um, activation or repressive functions for transcription. Um, historically, folks have, have focused on the interactions of MYC with its primary heterodimer partner, MAX, to develop antagonists of this particular protein-protein interaction. So this is also shown here. Um, and, uh, I think it's fair to say that people have been able to find antagonists, but none of these antagonists have actually led to therapeutics for a few reasons. Uh, many of these compounds tend to lack the sort of potencies that we expect, often double-digit micromolar uh, potencies. And on top of that, when you can find a compound that's potent, they tend to lack selectivity and target other helix loop helix proteins like CBP alpha, FOS, June, et cetera. Um, Additionally, as I said, this is the sort of prototype of one of those very floppy proteins, and MYC in itself really has almost no order unless it's, it's in partnership with its heterodimer partner, MAX. But we are crazy, so we decided to go after it anyhow. And uh, we ran a number of, of different screens involving both purified proteins, full-length MYC, full-length MAX, presumably intrinsically disordered. We have folks in the group who are also thinking about running screens um, in different uh, cell lines corresponding to different tumors of origin where MYC is uh, overexpressed at high levels um, and using uh, antibodies as a, a way to read out binding to these arrays. So for the screen that I'm going to tell you about, we used full-length pure MYC and MAX, and we screened only about 45,000 compounds on these arrays spanning a broad spectrum of different um, sources, including diversity-oriented synthesis compounds, kinase inhibitor libraries, HDAC inhibitor libraries, et cetera. The sort of summary from the screen is that we found 313 putative binders to MYC or MAX, and we then took these putative binders and punched them into a reporter gene assay, a series of reporter gene assays, a MYC-driven uh, dual reporter assay, CBP-alpha dual reporter assay, to try and prioritize compounds that selectively modulated MYC-driven transcription over other uh, transcriptional programs. We found 13 hits that inhibit MYC-driven transcription in cells with potencies under 10 micromolar. And while they, that may not be impressive to folks who think a lot about kinases, again, this is, this is actually pretty good for, um, for our field. And just to show you here, one of the sort of classic um, probe compounds, which is a MYC-MAX antagonist, a published probe, is this yellow curve here. And we found compounds that are superior, including compounds that are, are single-digit micromolar. One of the great things about being in Cambridge also is that we get to hang out with a bunch of you folks, and we get to hang out with, with folks who are in industry and um, who've been thinking about other types of challenging targets as well as transcription factors. And so through our interactions with colleagues uh, in the Boston area in industry, we've developed a sort of different critical path for uh, probe discovery here, where we start with a binding assay. And rather than going to a biophysical binding assay of some other flavor, some sort of quantitative assay, we go straight into a porter assay, as I mentioned, go straight into cells, use this as our sort of filter for moving compounds forward. We then profile our compounds in, in viability assays, or cancer cell line uh, sensitivity assays, and we choose compounds to promote to early mechanistic studies. So in the case of MYC, do the compounds prevent binding to DNA? Do the compounds disrupt the MYC-MAX protein-protein interaction? Do the compounds alter known post-translational modifications to MYC? Do they alter MYC uh, transcript or protein levels? Do they alter MAX protein uh, or transcript levels? So this would take too long to summarize all of this work around 13 compounds, but what I'll tell you is that we've, through this work, we've prioritized two different series, KIMS1 and KIMS2, one which binds to MYC and one which binds to MAX, and they uh, modulate MYC-driven transcription in that reporter assay in the single-digit micromolar range. We've then moved these compounds into the next step in our mind, which is to demonstrate that they that they engage the target in live cells um, or in, in a cellular setting. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how our lab is, is approaching this. Um, we tend to use infinity, affinity enrichment studies coupled to quantitative mass spec. 
And then once we've demonstrated target engagement, we go through a bunch of other types of studies, SAR, cell cycle, RNA-seq, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Basically trying to figure out more about um, higher order mechanism of action. So uh, for both MS1 and MS2, we um, were able to take advantage of a number of different cellular reagents to sort of look at whether these compounds impacted viability. For MS1, we convinced our colleagues across the street at the Broad to profile, um, uh, profile this compound in a panel of about 800 different cancer cell lines that have been genomically annotated. Um, and what we found was that this particular compound killed most cell lines. Um, and there are certain subsets of cell lines that were more sensitive than others. But when we asked whether that sensitivity profile correlated to MYC expression level, we didn't see a correlation. Um, we've also had good fortune to collaborate with uh, Dean Felcher at the Stanford School of Medicine, who's developed a broad spectrum of conditional cell line stocks, inducible systems, uh, TALL, RCC, osteosarcoma, hepatocellular carcinoma. And we've profiled a number of our compounds through these, uh, through in these cell lines. And we see things that have improved potency. We, have, um, we see things with good co hill coefficients, good things with sort of crazy hill coefficients. But we find things, again, with single-digit micromolar potencies. And then we use sort of a gold standard reagent. This is, a, a, again, a DOCS-inducible uh, system involving a B-cell line to ask, when you take MYC away from the system, you know, do we see differences in activity with our compounds when MYC is present versus when MYC is not present? When we did this, we found that our MYC binder appeared to have what we think is an off-target effect, meaning that there was not a significant window of difference between when MYC is around and, and when MYC is not around. Um, our MAX binder, on the other hand, actually has a, t a window that's roughly tenfold. So based on data across these different types of cell, cell line viability assays, we started to think we might, think we might pursue this MAX binder a bit more. Also working with Dean's lab, um, they have uh, have, have developed a series of biomarkers of MYC inactivation. And here I'm showing you a panel involving an osteosarcoma conditional line where they're looking at the expression levels of the specific DNA repair protein when MYC is turned off and then in response to some of our compounds. And what you can see is that both the MYC and the MAX compounds will lead to a decrease in expression of this marker. But the, the uh, MAX binder will actually more completely phenocopy uh, MYC inactivation when you also look at cell morphology. And Dean has told us that while he's surveyed a number of compounds from different groups and industry groups in particular that modulate MYC, he's never seen this particular coupling of phenotypes. So this was another reason why we started to think more about um, the MAX binder. We've also been evaluating target engagement using a variety of methods. So uh, we, uh, we profile most of our compounds in full-length kinase profiling assays. And when we did this, we found that our, our MYC compound actually had an off-target, whereas our MAX compound did not. Our MYC compound appeared to be, to be modulating a specific kinase that I had never heard of until this experiment called HASPEN. HASPEN's only known function is to modulate uh, phosphorylation of histone H3 at 3 and 3 um, when we asked whether the compound was modulating this mark in, in a cellular setting, we did not see that the compound would modulate the mark, whereas another uh, Haspen compound did modulate that mark. So right now we're trying to understand a little bit more about what Haspen does and what the relationship is between Haspen and MYC. We also have folks in the lab who are um, performing classic bead paste pull downs where we link the compounds to beads and ask what do we fish out of a cell lysate. Um, and in both cases, we've been able to demonstrate that the compound actually pulls down the target. And consistent with data that we have around these compounds, suggesting that uh, the, the compounds do not directly block the MIC-MAX interaction, we pull down both MIC and MAX uh, for both of our compounds. And we also pull down this potential off-target Haspen in the case of MS1. More recently, we've spent a lot of time synthesizing photoreactive probes. So what we do here is we walk diazerin groups around the compound consistent with our, our knowledge about SAR. We treat cells, shine light, form a covalent bond, and then we install either a fluor or a biotin group and then pull down or illuminate on a gel. And in the case of the MS2 compound, we've been able to fish out uh, with active analogs a, a band around uh, 20 kilodaltons, which is what uh, Max's molecular weight is. We also see a band around 60 kilodaltons, which at first we thought might be MYC, but um, it turns out that this particular band comes down with inactive analogs as well, and we see this um, with completely unrelated uh, compounds and unrelated targets. 
So ongoing, we're actually trying to ident come up with the identity of these bands using quantitative uh, mass spectrometry methods. And then finally, uh, you know, with Dean, we decided, well, we have an unoptimized compound, but it looks, it looks intriguing. The, we built some next generation compounds that were actually sub-micromolar in terms of potency, and he thought he would actually evaluate whether these compounds um, had any kind of efficacy in a mic driven um, model of TALL. So we took a shot in the dark and um, actually evaluated this compound in a couple of different settings using IV administration, IP administration, pre-treating cells prior to transplant. And what we do see is some pre preliminary results that are encouraging in that we see a shift in um, tumor, tumor volume. Um, and again, since these are sort of unoptimized compounds, our goal now is to go back and start to think about optimizing these compounds from a medicinal chemistry standpoint and optimize these experiments to the model. So what we know is that we have a compound that binds to max. What I didn't tell you is that this compound uh, actually leads to a decrease in uh, MYC protein and transcript levels. But we don't exactly understand how that happens. So we have folks in the lab who are collaborating with, with people at the Broad Institute to try and characterize the interactome of, of max plus or minus um, compound to understand what protein-protein interactions might be at play. We're also collaborating with folks like Charles Lin, who trained in Rick's lab, to understand what are the consequences of compound treatment when you look at occupancy of these different transcription factors or look at gene expression programs. Um, and so this is all work that's underway. Uh, we're hoping that you know, in, in the next year or so, we'll have a better feel for what the true mechanism of action is for this compound. But what we really want to spend time doing is trying to optimize the compound and to actually do this in a structure-driven way. So we're also collaborating with investigators with experience in NMR to see if we can map the actual binding site of the compound to, to max. And these are the people who really sort of run the show. We have a, a bunch of uh, postdocs and graduate students with sort of a broad set of experience, chemistry, engineering, uh, biology. And um, I want to give a special shout out to Dylan Neal, who's now at Harvard Medical, student, uh, medical School as a, uh, as a medical student. Um, he joined my lab when he was an undergraduate at Harvard. And when everyone was spending their time thinking about Mick, 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 he said, I might take a chance on this particular MAX compound. And without that decision, we probably wouldn't have the MS2 series today. Um, and then we also benefit from collaborations with a number of people in the local area and, and outside of Boston. Any questions? How generalizable is this technology to other transcription factors? So um, I'm actually showing you one of our least mature programs here. It's sort of in the spirit of this event. Yeah. Um, but um, like I said, we've screened 100 different human transcription factors to date. Uh, we've, um, I think, f we found hits for a number of those. Uh, we have limited bandwidth because we're a small lab, but we've um, been able to find probes of several ETS family transcription factors. We've published some of that. Um, we've been able to find probes of nuclear, or, or of different uh, nuclear hormone receptors, which might not be so much of a surprise. Um, and uh, we have a, a project involving a natural product and FOXA1, for example. Um, many of the master regulators that Rick had on his uh, slide are, are active programs, or things for which we have candidate probes in the lab. Whilst people collect their thoughts, I have a question. <laughs> Would you care to comment on sort of what is the next step for you and how you might see translating this to benefit cancer patients? What are the different options that you as an MIT faculty member have to now translate your bench findings, discoveries into the clinic? Yeah, so I, I think um, so certainly thinking about these questions related to mechanism of action, that's something that our lab is well suited to do, and we, we've you know, established partnerships with different folks in the local area to think about that, those mechanistic questions. And while our group, um, we have a number of medicinal chemists in the lab, uh, the costs really start to go up at this stage. And, and to be honest, we really need to think about good old-fashioned medicinal chemistry. Um, so. Uh, it's still to be debated how much of that we do here uh, at the Koch Institute. And then thinking about 
um, in vivo study. So I just showed you a very quick early experiment, but the costs of going through all of Dean's models as our full analyses um, makes it a challenge for us to raise funds through the traditional mechanisms. So right now we're working with the Desponde Center that um, is a, a group here at MIT that's meant to um, help investigators start to think about what we traditionally call a v the valley, a valley of death, um, and to try and identify models for moving these compounds um, out of uh, an academic lab and into maybe a more appropriate setting for downstream studies, preclinical studies. 